Yeah, Pohakaloa. We haven't talked about that before. We should talk about that. And we have Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Cronin to talk about it with us here on the Military in Hawaii on Think Tech. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Aloha, Jay. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we want to talk to, we want to know more about Pohakaloa. You know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a student of the Big Island. The Big Island has so much. You know, you, I mean, there's, there's every, every inch, there's a surprise and a delight. And Pohakalo is one of those things. It's been there for a long time. So give us the, the stats on it. How long has it been there? How big is it? Uh, how many people are there? That's right, Jay. It's, uh, it, it is a great, uh, great surprise here on the Big Island. So thanks so much for having me on the show and, and giving me the opportunity to, to talk about the great mission we have here at Pohakalo Training Area and the great team that supports that mission. So. Uh, Pualkaloa Training Area is located on the Big Island in the Saddle region between Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. Um, Daniel K. Noy Highway, also known as Saddle Road, passes right, right by our gate. And uh, it's 133,000 uh, square eight, uh, 133, acres or 210 square miles. And it's, it's the, one of the largest training areas in the Pacific Basin region for our forces who are assigned here in the Pacific region to come here and do their large scale key collective and crew training events so that they can achieve the highest levels of readiness. And we've been doing, th we've been doing this mission for quite some time. So it was established as an army garrison in 1956. So, so get, getting up there. But previously during World War II, we traced our lineage to Camp Tarawa and the Marines who came to Hawaii Island to rest, refit, and train after the, 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 the bloody battle of Tarawa, consolidate all the lessons they learned there, and then go on to their subsequent victories in the Pacific at Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima with the 2nd and Marine, uh, to second and 5th Marine Division. So we trace our lineage um, to them, and that's what we do here today. We train, we prepare, we consolidate on lessons learned, and so we're as ready as possible uh, if and when our nation's men and women, our volunteers, are called into harm's way to fight and win our nation's battles. So is Pohakalo all Army now, or does it include Marines as well? It's an Army garrison, but that's a great point. Today. It is very much a joint training area. So the, the, the biggest customer is, is U.S. Army, but the Marines are, are close close second. We have a great relationship with the Marines who come here to train and use this, this area quite, quite a bit. And then we also have Air Force and Navy come here to train. And so that training, that's how we fight. We fight with all the services integrating together uh, in a combat situation. And you're able to do that here at Pohakaloa Training Area. You're able to exercise all those services in, in conjunction, in coordination, get those practice runs, get those repetitions, and just be as prepared as possible. And you're the commander? That's right. Um, it's my honor to be the, the commander of this garrison. What's a garrison? A garrison is an army war, word for, for a base. You could use the word base. You could, uh, so. <laughs> I, we've all heard that word a thousand times, but you know, until this conversation, I never asked anybody. Exactly what it meant. We got to I always have to be cognizant of, uh, you know, the army got lingo and, and, and language, you know, make sure it's clear for everyone. So what kind of a duty station is this for you? I mean, it's kind of remote. Uh, is, it, is it a sweet deal or, or is it hard work? It's both. It's, it's a sweet deal and, it's, and, and, and it is hard work. But that's what, uh, that's what uh, we sign up for as, as professionals, uh, professional military leaders. We want the hard jobs, we want the hard work, but it, it's a great honor. I say it's a sweet deal because it's a great honor to kind of have a, a key, key role in ensuring our nation's men and women are as prepared as possible for combat, uh, our nation's men and women in uniform. And that's a sacred obligation. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's important for our, our nation um, because it adds to, to our readiness, which is a moral imperative to ensure our nation's uh, men and women are as, it's an operational imperative to make sure they're as prepared as possible. 
but it's also a moral imperative, a sacred, sacred obligation. We, you have to make sure that our nation's men and women get the best training possible. And so I play a role in that. And the great team here plays, plays a role in that. And, and I'm proud to be on that team. There's two much. Sorry, go ahead, Jay. Uh, yeah, I want to get to that, but uh, uh, you know what? What is what is your? I don't know if they call it uh, mo. What is your? Mm, um, in the Coast Guard, we had a different word for it. But what what is your uh, specialty uh, that that makes you um, you know appropriate for this job? Uh, are you into training? Is that what your uh, your basic um, specialty is? So so in the Army, we call it MOS, military. Mm -hmm. uh, occupational specialty. And so mine is 18 Alpha, which is Special Forces Officer. So you could very much say that I'm into training and I understand the importance of training and how good training is key um, uh, and beneficial in, in its, when you find yourself in a combat situation. Uh, you have to do it, you have to get on the ground, you have to replicate the conditions of combat as closely as possible. So you're as effective as possible, along with your team in a combat situation. Um, and so the Army, uh, as a lieutenant colonel, selected me to uh, command this garrison. And, and yeah, I would say my background um, and experience is, is well suited uh, to this mission. So if I, if I wanted to get your job, Kevin, I'd have to do a lot of, a lot of push-ups, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the, uh, the, the push is part of our, our, our new Army combat uh, fitness test and release push. <laughs> well, yeah, let's talk about, uh, you know, at, at any given moment in time, how many people have you got there? Is this a year-round sort of thing or is it seasonal? Uh, they come and go in groups? Do the groups interact between the branches? Uh, uh, and, and do they all have the same kind of training or different training manuals that apply different for different groups who are, you know, who come and spend time with you? Absolutely. So it definitely um, ebbs and flows uh, uh, based on different times of the year. So right now we're in a lull, but over the past two months, we're at a peak and we peaked at about 1,300 uh, predominantly soldiers here at one day. Um, and the, the training varies based on the unit's needs and requirements and desires. And so they come out early. They send an advanced party to, to do a reconnaissance and prepare and plan that training based on what they assess their unit needs to train on. And the team here works with them and is able to facilitate and support that training. Um, we, uh, we train about 13,000 soldiers, Marines, sailors, and airmen a year. Uh, it's a low right now, but over the next couple of weeks, it'll pick up a little bit with about 400 Marines coming here for, for RIMPAC, Rim of the Pacific exercise, and some allies and partners to conduct some key training here. And then we'll, and then in August, we'll have uh, the Hawaii Army National Guard and 100th Battalion um, U.S. Army Reserves come here to do their annual training. We are extremely proud of that. Uh, we are the home for training for the Hawaii Army National Guard, our, our state citizen soldiers. I was going to ask you about that. That's good. So, I mean, everybody who could get trained gets trained. I, I saw a movie last night, Kevin, and I, I think it was Netflix about an, 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 a, an agency in uh, the British government in the war. Um, and it was working actually with the American government for a while. Um, and it was uh, in charge of recruiting spies, um, you know, to, to deploy in, you know, continental Europe. And, um, you know, to, to support the resistance and so forth. And training was really important in that movie. Uh, I mean, I, uh, what I took away from that movie, if you ask me for a, a practical takeaway, is that if you are not trained, you are at much greater risk. If you are trained, um, you know, you, you can do a better job. You can succeed in whatever your mission was. And, and it's dangerous not to be completely trained. Uh, do you agree with that? Is that is that part of your, you know, your your system there? I, I wholeheartedly agree with that assessment, Jay. Uh, the better training you have, the more training you have, 
the closer that training replicates the conditions of combat, the more prepared and the more effective you'll be in a combat situation. That's from, from an actual application in combat, if you find yourself in combat, but it's also from a deterrence perspective. You look at, uh, and you know, peace through strength, um, you look at uh, deterrence made up of two key components, capability and will. And a key, key component of capability is readiness. And so, I mean, you bet adversaries are always assessing readiness. Uh, potential adversaries are always assessing readiness. So the more trained you are, the more um, you, you're able to apply that training and, you know, uh, and, and kind of apply uh, lessons that you see around the world from other combat situations to that training, um, the more you're able to, to fight um, or train with other services, and incorporate maneuver on the ground and aircraft fires and artillery fires, the more prepared and the, and the, the, the better you're, you're going to do in combat. Now let's talk about the parameters of training. I mean, one thing strikes me is that uh, my guess is that the units who come and see you remain together. In other words, you're not you're juggling them around. You're not sending, you know, you're scrambling the units uh, among training units. You're keeping them together because Part of training is training together. It's the teamwork thing. It's knowing, you know, your buddies, knowing your the guys in your unit really well, and and caring about them. And so, uh, am I right about that, or do you scramble them? No, it's all it's all about the team. And so you come here, and you've uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Jay. It's all about the team. So you come here, and you're able to to do that training as a team. And you know, the army's always kind of. Um, there's always an, an assignments process and, and new people are being cycled in and, and, and uh, people who've been in the unit a little longer are, are being cycled out. So here's where those newer people are able to come train together as a team called collective training um, and get that practice uh, um, and kind of know, you know, they know that they, they come out of here and they, they know who the sound of their leader's voice in the dark, you know, and, 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 and can kind of um, uh, maneuver that way. So do, 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 does your staff at Pohakaloa um, train, directly train the people who come for training or do the various branches and units send their own trainers to do the training uh, you know, under your command at Pohakaloa? The, the, the units that come here send, send the trainers um, as, as part of the units. That's a, that's a unit role and responsibility. What the team here at Pakaloa does, kind of the institution, um, and it's, and it's major, majority civilians, uh, 230 team members who work here day in and day out, and there's, there's only two active duty military, myself and the command sergeant major. Uh, civilians who, who live in the community, are from the community for quite some time, um, they facilitate the training through providing services, support, infrastructure, and then there's a there's a branch here that we call uh, Range Operations Division, and they support the ranges and they ensure uh, range scheduling. They ensure the targetry on the ranges is is appropriate. They ensure the safety zones are correct, and they kind of help synchronize the training. So when the units rotate through. Um, they can just get at, hit the ground running and get after it. Yeah, you gotta be careful on those ranges. I remember when I was in uh, the Coast Guard, they, they said, oh, you lawyers, you know, you, you, you have to get out and, uh, and, and train too. So they sent me down to Cape May to get trained on, a, on, a, on, a, on, on weapons. And uh, I was there on the firing line with a 45. And all of a sudden, the chief, you know, started yelling at me and he, you know, and he stopped everybody, you know, at ease or whatever it was. And he came over and he looked at my 45 and noticed the barrel was cracked. And uh, he might have saved my life, you know, just to notice that kind of thing. So when you go out of the range, everything has to be careful and observed. And the people who supervise it have to watch out for any kind of thing that happened because you're dealing with lethal equipment, no? Absolutely, Jay. It's, a, it's serious business. And we have all sorts of uh, uh, mechanisms, control measures. And most importantly, uh, ex experienced leaders, non-commissioned officers and officers 
who are ensuring that the training is conducted safely. Yeah. Well, so we read about uh, Ukraine. We read, read about the new weapons that the president would like to give them, maybe is giving them, I don't know, right now in terms of uh, long range artillery and so forth. Um, and the Ukrainians, unfortunately, have no, you know, no, no training experience themselves in how to operate the, the, you know, these high tech uh, artillery devices. And so I, I wonder if, the, if that's one of the things you deal with. In other words, uh, the latest and greatest um, field artillery, what have you, uh, other equipment that the Army may use in the field. Uh, are you training these trainees on, on equipment as well as uh, um, you know, doing the range and doing push-ups? Absolutely. The, the, the units that come here are, are, are being trained on their equipment, their organic equipment, um, their unit level equipment. And that equipment is always being updated. Um, and so when, it, when a unit gets a new piece of equipment, um, coming out to PTA, to, especially for artillery pieces like you're re referring to, is a key step in the progression um, to practice using that, that piece of equipment. So you'll see that with artillery pieces here, um, absolutely. And then the size of PTA allows for uh, artillery units uh, maneuverability because like as you see in Ukraine um, it's not a good idea to stay in one place for too long so you practice you practice your shooting you know um, uh, targeting the enemy and then you move um, and a uh, phenomenal place for PTA to do that training uh, which you know is kind of what you see in Ukraine you know in various um, commands uh, within the military there's training um, by people who are not in the U.S. military. They come from other countries. Uh, we invite them here, we train them, we, you know, they're our allies after all. Does that happen in Pohakaloa? Yes, allies and partners uh, come here and train um, a fair amount. Uh, not, 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 not all the time, but they, they'll, they'll rotate through like in RIMPAC, uh, we'll have some allies and partners here. And that's also critically important because we talk about training like, like we fight. Well, we're going to fight joint, and we're going to fight as part of an, an alliance with allies and partners. So we're, we get that uh, those opportunities to train here at PTA and in, in improve and increase our inter, interoperability, which is really important. You know, part of training, is, at least the way it's emerging, part of you know being in charge of a group of people, at least the way it's emerging, is to make sure they're mentally healthy. And I, and I wonder if uh, the training protocols that you have or the independent uh, branches that, you know, come around and, get, and train their people at Pohakalo are also uh, evaluating and training people to make sure that they're okay, because not everybody in the world is okay, especially if you have somebody who's been through a few rotations in dangerous areas and, you know, and comes back with the side effects of PTSD. So query, um, is, is that a focus of either the command, your command, or um, possibly the individual branch leaders who come and do training? I would, I would say that that's definitely a focus of, of mine and the team here and, and the, uh, the units and the leaders that rotate through uh, and the units that train here. It's a focus of everyone in the military. Uh, it's, it's, it's important that we, we you know, people first. It's the number one priority in, in, the, in the U.S. Army. And so it's important that we're always kind of checking in and working with, with our people to ensure that they're ready and resilient. And uh, train, good training is a great uh, piece of being ready and resilient. You, you develop cohesive teams, you get experience, you, you're proud of what you accomplished. And so PTA, that tr the training here um, helps contribute to that. And then leaders at Echelon, from team leaders, which are corporals, all the way up to uh, lieutenant, lieutenants, colonel, and colonel, and general officer are always checking up on, on their leaders and their subordinates to make sure um, everyone's doing, doing okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's really important, I think, um, <clears throat> because, you know, an, an army that is uh, together psychologically is certainly going to be a, a, a better army. I was joking before about um, push ups, but um, is push ups. <laughs> <laughs> it's push-ups in the program. I mean, training to me is a lot of guys have desk jobs, you know, they never get out much and 
like the rest of us, they, they get a little pudgy. Um, but but query, when, when I go to Pocalo and some of this training, am I going to get trained up physically as well as uh, militarily? So it's, it's the, the units, you know, it's a, again, it's a unit responsibility. I, I do my physical training um, here, uh, but the units, they, they, they maintain their physical fitness while they're here. So they're training on their weapon systems. They're training, maneuvering on the ground, incorporating artillery and aircraft fires. But, and they're also doing, doing physical fitness. We have, a, we have a fantastic gym here. We're at 6,500 6, feet elevation. Um, so you, you come here and you're training at altitude and it's, it's good. It's a good workout. Uh, <laughs> it's a little tougher than at sea level, eh? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm up here at altitude and then I take my physical fitness test down at sea level. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great way to go. You know, I've, I've hiked up the other side, uh, you know, opposite Pohakaloa and the Saddle Road, you can go, uh, I guess it's south or southeast as well, and go up top of Mauna Loa. Then going up to the top of Mauna Loa, you know, you have to make, make tracks to get up there before sunset, because at sunset, it gets very cold. I'm, I'm sure that's the case in Pohakaloa too. And when it gets cold, you know, you really want to be in the cabin up there or, you know, camped out, because otherwise you freeze. And so you have, you have to rush. And when you rush, you're going up the altitude, you know, so quickly. And there's pulmonary edema issues. There's all kinds of issues relating to, you know, uh, what do I call it, systemic reaction um, to the altitude. Does this happen in Pohakaloa too? So 6,500, not, not as much. People will get winded and fatigued, but you're not going to see that altitude sickness. Um, very rarely. Like, I, like I should mention that uh, Mauna Loa, the summit of Mauna Loa is more like um, 12,500 or 13,000. So that's right. double double the altitude. Exactly. But it gets cold here at night, like you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, temperature will drop, that's for sure. So yeah, so I expect that, you know, all the bunks are, uh, are heated, yeah? And you have a jacuzzi just outside? Yeah, no, no, not so much. <laughs> I will I'll say, though, at that point, you know, We've emphasized uh, training throughout our, our discussion, you know, rightly so. This is, this is you know, we provide readiness to, to um, uh, our, our leaders and our, our, our commands here in the Pacific, um, U.S. Army Pacific, and then Indo-PACOM to contribute to their uh, strategy. Um, but what we do a lot, which I, I assess is a key component of readiness and critical to a military mission, is we, we interact with the community quite a bit. And so you're, to your point about altitude sickness and hiking on Mauna Loa, um, our, our emergency responders here uh, respond to those emergencies. And we regularly rescue lost and stranded and um, you know, hikers who are experiencing issues. We respond to vehicle fires and accidents on Saddle Road about three times per week. Um, oh, and we're wow. quite a bit and we're able to get there faster um, because because of our proximity and that free, you know, that helps out our community, which is super important to us. The other thing that we do um, is our fire department will help respond in the event of a wildfire, which is a huge risk um, in the United States and the state of Hawaii and here on, on the Big Island and even more so because of the drought conditions. And so last summer. We responded, uh, we helped respond to the 50,000 acre uh, Mauna Road wildfire. Had helicopters come from Oahu, five helicopters. Uh, firefighters come from Oahu, our firefighters here, our bulldozer operators. We all responded as part of the community and team effort to help arrest the spread of that fire and stop it from being even more devastating uh, than it already is. And another um, program that we're proud to to announce that was just released is called the Readiness and Environmental um, Protection Integration Program, REPI. And uh, the, the Department of Defense just released a uh, 4.8 million uh, program to improve uh, wildfire management adjacent to PTA. The uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources, we call it a REPI Challenge, proposed this. DOD uh, accepted it, and so it's a matching funds program um, that totals 4.8 million. And we're going to improve fire breaks, fuel breaks, 
roads um, to get after the wildfire risk together. What about aircraft? Do you have any helicopters that are, uh, you know, assigned to Pohakaloa or have to call them in? So when, when we have training here, we always have medevac helicopters here on our, on our airfield. It's a C-130 capable airfield. When there's not training, like, like right now, there's the, air, the aircraft go back to Oahu so they can get their maintenance, rest, and refit. But in the event of an emergency situation um, to support the fight of a uh, wildfire fight, they'll come over from Oahu. Yeah, sure. That's to support the training. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Oh, one other area you touched on it is uh, Pohakaloa is right there, uh, you know, on the hillside and then I guess the northern hillside of uh, Mauna Kea, which is a sensitive cultural area. And you, you do engage, uh, you, you do work with um, you know, various groups of Native Hawaiians about that. Can you talk about what you do and what your relationship is and what the sensitivities are? Absolutely. So community engagement is so important to the military. We're from the community. We are the community's army. We're your army. And so it's really important um, to engage and have um, uh, dialogue with the community. And, um, and so we go about that a variety of different ways. We, we both informally and formally have um, dialogues and meetings and engagements with Native Hawaiian organizations and Native Hawaiian individuals. Um, to, to talk with them and dialogue and engage, engage in a dialogue and in, in a, in a, in develop understanding in a transparent manner. Um, we have what's called the Kohoa process, which are, um, which, you know, community led engagement dialogue um, uh, to kind of interact and, 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 and develop relationships, which is, which is really important. We understand that there's um, lots of sensitivities. Uh, and there's and there's some people who who don't agree with our presence here, but um, but I still you know we still try to engage and we still try to talk about our mission and the importance of our mission and hear those concerns and dialogue and see uh, look for opportunities to work together in a transparent and respectful manner. Yeah, I told you um, you know the back when in the days of uh, Senator Dana Kaka, I met Noelani Kalipi. Who was on his staff, and later on, I, I met her in the context of um, organizations uh, on the Big Island um, that deal with Pohakaloa, among other things. Um, and uh, she had only good words uh, for Pohakaloa. She was on the show about a year ago, and I really appreciated that. Uh, it was all very positive. When you get a chance, take a look at Think Tech and look her up, and <laughs> you'll be able to see what she was saying about you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well. Uh... So Noilani Kalipi is our civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, appointed by our Secretary of the Army, Christine Warmoth, um, to help exactly what you just described with that community um, engagement and be the Secretary's uh, touch point um, here on the island. And she's uh, been, been a great partner for us. So where's the future take, uh, where's the future take things, Kevin? Where does the future take you in a, in a career built around training and commanding facilities, uh, garrisons like Pohakaloa? Um, and, and where does it take the Army? I imagine that uh, Pohakaloa is not the only training facility in the whole Army. There must be others. Maybe one of these days you'll get orders to another one. Uh, how, how does it look for you? How does it look for training in general? Uh, on the basis uh, of what you said before, it's really critical that the Army be well trained uh, for internal and external purposes. Um, so just tell us about the program um, around the world and for you. That's right, Jay. Well, I still have some time here in the seat. And so I'm focused on this job and doing it, doing it well and doing it as, uh, you know, going as hard as I can to help um, get this great, you know, facilitate this, this, this important training that happens here. Uh, from, from where Pocalo training area fits kind of into the, into the, grand scheme here in the, in the Indo-Pacific region, um, it's only increasing in importance. Uh, the, the, our senior leaders have said that this region, the Indo-Pacific region is the most consequential region for our nation's future now, go, and now going into the future. And China is our pacing challenge. And so, uh, you know, just, it goes kind of in line with that, that 
the forces who are assigned here in the region need to get great training. And so PTA is a key component of that great training, particularly from a land forces perspective. General Flynn, uh, the US Army Pacific uh, commander, uh, he, he's implemented what's called the Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center. And uh, this, this, this JPMRC is a regional combat training center. So similar to what you see um, in, in Europe and Germany, uh, now we have one in the Pacific region. And what this does is it allows the units to, to stay in the region, train in the conditions uh, of the region where they're assigned to, and it keeps their equipment and the personnel in the region instead of having to uh, ship all that equipment and personnel back to the mainland um, where, where that's, the, that's where you would have to go if you weren't able to train here at ETA. And so um, with this new JPMRC initiative, PTA is only increasing in importance because it's a key component, a key hub of that initiative. Any, and other, big, any other big training facilities anywhere else? And I'll just say it contributes to the <laughs> overall strategy in, in the region, JPMRC, because those, those forces train here, they achieve the highest levels of readiness those units, and then they rotate forward into the region, uh, even farther west, uh, you know, past the international date line, and then they conduct training and exercises with allies and partners. Um, so for other training, other training areas like PTA uh, in, the, in the Pacific Basin region, you'd have to go back to the mainland. Okay. Well, we covered a lot of ground and I only have uh, one suggestion for you. I like to make suggestions to our guests, you know, <clears throat> so it's, it's night, it's a little cooler. Um, you know, your people in training programs have had a tough day and, uh, and I assume that you have wireless up there. I assume you get the internet. Um, so what, what you guys can do and girls uh, is tune into ThinkTech. And, and have and have our kind of education and training. I might even look up uh, Kalipi, Noelani, Noelani Kalipi, and uh, see what she has to say. <laughs> so that could be part of your training protocol, Kevin. That, yeah, I like it, Jay. Yeah, you know, <laughs> training, training encompasses a wide variety of aspects. Yeah, great. Great to talk to you. Great to meet you. Great to, you know, to feel the energy and, and to see what you're doing up there. You know, it's, it's been kind of a remote area. I passed it by so many times on the saddle road, seen it at great distance. And this brings it much closer for me and a lot of people. So I appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks, Jay. It's, it's my pleasure. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.